Raise your hand if you think America is headed in the right direction politically. No one? I didn't think so. But what if I told you that 2,400 years ago, the Greek philosopher Plato solved our political crisis? Plato has a message for Americans who want to save our country, and that message is, don't vote Republican or Democrat. Vote philosopher. If you read Plato's dialogues, something interesting will happen over and over again. Plato, through his character Socrates, will point to some moral or political problem in society, and you'll realize that we have the exact same problem today. On certain issues, we've made shockingly little progress since the fourth century BC. So Plato draws attention to a problem, and then he offers his solution. And his solution, with very few exceptions, will sound absolutely ridiculous and insane. As a rule, when Plato is telling you how to fix something, he comes across like a complete lunatic. So people dismiss Plato's solution because it sounds absurd. But if we would just pause, and think about the point he's making, we would see that Plato is actually pointing us in the right direction and that he sees something that most people today have missed entirely. Take Plato's Republic. The Republic is the world's first great work in political philosophy and more than two millennia later, it's still the most influential. Plato's official task in the Republic is to answer the questions, what is justice? And why is it always better to be just rather than unjust, even if you could get away with being unjust? But along the way, he discusses the soul, education, medical ethics, censorship, and all kinds of other topics, almost always proposing solutions that seem really, really strange. One of Plato's strangest proposals, especially to philosophers, is that philosophers should be kings. Plato says, again, through his character Socrates, Until philosophers rule as kings in cities, or those who are now called kings and leading men genuinely and adequately philosophize, that is, until political power and philosophy entirely coincide, while the many natures who at present pursue either one exclusively are forcibly prevented from doing so, cities will have no rest from evils, Glaucon, nor, I think, will the human race. So, right now, as back then, there's political power over here, and there's philosophy over here. Plato says that until political power and philosophy coincide, the human race will have no rest from evils. How do you get political power to coincide with philosophy? Either philosophers have to become kings, or kings have to become philosophers. Now, I have two master's degrees and a PhD in philosophy, and I've never met a philosopher who thinks that this is a good idea. A lot of philosophers can barely turn their computers on. I know I can't. Why would we think that they're capable of running a government? By the way, Plato's suggestion would have sounded at least as ridiculous in ancient Greece as it does now. Philosophers had a reputation for being people with their heads in the clouds, totally useless for everyday life. But if you suppress the gag reflex when you hear Plato's suggestion, and you spend a few minutes figuring out why Plato said that philosophers should be kings, you might realize that Plato had a point. Plato's concept of a philosopher is a bit different from ours. For Plato, a philosopher is someone who sees a beautiful woman, sees a beautiful sunrise, sees a beautiful painting, and then asks, What is beauty itself? The philosopher becomes obsessed with the idea, not of particular beautiful things, but of beauty itself. And he focuses on understanding beauty itself until he knows what beauty is. And then he understands why beautiful things are all beautiful. The philosopher does the same thing with goodness and justice and so on. He sees examples of justice and injustice, but he fixates on justice itself until he understands the nature of justice. Once he understands the nature of justice, he understands why certain states of affairs are just or unjust. Plato knows that people who walk around trying to understand beauty itself, goodness itself, justice itself, 
will probably be pretty terrible at politics because they won't care much about politics and because they have no experience with politics. So he thinks that philosophers need to be forced to enter the world of politics. They won't be interested. You have to make them do it. You have to make them apply their understanding of beauty and goodness and justice to politics. Most philosophers today would not agree with Plato's concept of a philosopher. But as I've said, if you hear Plato out, he's on to something here. Plato gives several arguments to defend his claim that philosophers should be kings. We're going to read an allegory he presents in Book 6 of The Republic. He compares politicians competing for control of a city or state with sailors fighting for control of the helm of a ship. Socrates says, Imagine, then, that something like the following happens on a ship or on many ships. The ship owner is bigger and stronger than everyone else on board, but he's hard of hearing, a bit short-sighted, and his knowledge of seafaring is equally deficient. The sailors are quarreling with one another about steering the ship, each of them thinking that he should be the captain, even though he's never learned the art of navigation, cannot point to anyone who taught it to him or to a time when he learned it. Indeed, they claim that it isn't teachable and are ready to cut to pieces anyone who says that it is. So, these sailors are fighting for control of the ship, but they don't understand the art of navigation. They've never learned how to navigate a ship by looking at the stars. They don't understand sea currents and wind patterns. In other words, they don't know how to get the ship where they want it to go. And yet they're fighting for control of the ship. Remember, the sailors here represent people fighting for political power, control of the state. Plato continues and says, They're always crowding around the ship owner, begging him and doing everything possible to get him to turn the rudder over to them. And sometimes, if they don't succeed in persuading him, they execute the ones who do succeed or throw them overboard. And then, having stupefied their noble ship owner with drugs, wine, or in some other way, they rule the ship, using up what's in it and sailing in the way that people like that are prone to do. Moreover, they call the person who is clever at persuading or forcing the ship owner to let them rule a navigator, a captain, and one who knows ships and dismiss anyone else as useless. Remember, they don't understand the art of navigation, but whoever is good at getting control of the helm, they call him a navigator or a captain, even though the person doesn't actually know how to navigate a ship. He only knows how to get control of the ship. They don't understand that a true captain must pay attention to the seasons of the year, the sky, the stars, the winds, and all that pertains to his craft if he's really to be the ruler of a ship. And they don't believe there is any craft that would enable him to determine how he should steer the ship, whether the others want him to or not, or any possibility of mastering this alleged craft or of practicing it at the same time as the craft of navigation. Don't you think that the true captain will be called a real stargazer, a babbler, and a good-for-nothing by those who sail in ships governed in that way in which such things happen? Notice, the true captain is someone who's been trained in the art of navigation. He knows how to read the stars and the winds and the tides to get the ship where it's supposed to go. But someone like that will be busy looking at the stars or looking at the wind patterns he probably won't be busy fighting for control of the ship. And since he isn't fighting for control of the ship, the rest of the sailors call him useless. So, the one person who could actually navigate the ship doesn't have control of the ship. Who has control of the ship? People who are good at fighting, but terrible at navigating. What's the main qualification for getting political power in the U.S.? The main qualification is the ability to convince people to vote for you. Is the ability to get people to vote for you the same as the ability to be a good leader? No, they're two different abilities. Someone who's great at lying and manipulation will have the ability to convince people to vote for him. But being a great liar and a great manipulator doesn't mean that he'll be a good leader. 
Plato's view is that the people who could be the best leaders may never have any political power because they might be repulsed by politics. The people who could be the best leaders might look at what goes on in politics and say, I don't want to have anything to do with that ever. Making ads to make my opponent seem as evil as possible, making promises that we'll never be able to keep because that's the only way to get people to vote for you? Not interested. But that's what it takes to win, so I'm not going to win. Now, even with all of that said, it's still silly to say that we should make philosophers kings. Feel free to try, but it won't end well. Plato tried in real life, it did not end well. But what's more important here is an underlying point that runs throughout Plato's discussion. Think about this. If you're on a ship, is there a place where the ship should be heading? Is there a correct destination or is the ship just sailing around randomly? If there is a destination, how do you get there? Is there a correct way to get there? If there is a correct destination and there is a correct way to get there, then it's very, very important for the sailors to understand that. The sailors need to understand where they're going and how to get there. If they don't, then all that's left is fighting for control of the ship. If there's no real destination and no real way to get there, then all that matters is fighting for control. If you win, you get to control the ship for a while until someone comes along and knocks you out. And then he takes control and he gets to steer for a while. There's nothing beyond the fighting for temporary control. And the best that you can hope for is that you or the person you like best gets to steer for a while. How does this apply to us? Well, where should we or any nation be heading? What's the goal? Is there a goal that goes beyond my personal preference or your personal preference? If so, is there a correct way to get there? These are philosophical questions. So Plato's right that there should be some sort of overlap between philosophy and politics. And these philosophical questions should be brought to the surface in political discussions and debates. Tell me, candidate X, where do you plan to take our country? If you had complete control, what sort of country would you make for us? Paint us a picture of your ideal country. Then tell us why we should agree with you and not with your opponent's ideal country. Tell us how you propose to get us to your goal. Explain to us why you're right. Explain the art of navigating a country. If no one can tell us why they're right, and this is the horrifying part, if there is no correct goal that goes beyond personal preference, if there's no correct way to get there, then all that's left is fighting for power. And all we get to do is go back and forth from one party to the next, punching and kicking and biting on our miserable voyage to nowhere. Until philosophers are kings.